الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الذی قصرت عن رؤیته ابصار الناظرین وعجزت عن نعته اوہام الواسفین الحمد للہ رب العالمین الصلاة والسلام على شرف الانبیاء والمرسلین خاتم النبیین بالقاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الماسومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد ووالد وما ولد لقد خلقنا الإنسان في كبد صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات الجماعة السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ The verses that I recited are from chapter 90, Surah Balad, first four ayat. We talked about very briefly these ayat last Thursday night and wanted to continue on the same theme, inshallah, with the commemoration of the shahadat of our fourth imam, Imam Zainul Abideen, alayhi salatu wa salam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he is addressing in these ayat, he starts by swearing, by taking an oath, saying, La uqsimu bihad al-balad. There are different ways Mufassireen have gone, as far as the translation goes. Some mention that this word, La uqsimu bihad al-balad, the translation is that I do not swear by this city. But they actually say, no, I swear by this city. I'm taking an oath by this city. I said, so does that not negate the word la? Because we've come to learn the word la, which is to negate something, which is to negate a sentence. Then how is it possible that the word la is starting this ayat with the word la, la uqsimu, which should mean that I do not need to swear, I do not need to take an oath, bihad al-balad. But if you pick up the books of Quran and the translations, you will find unanimously the translation is, that I indeed take an oath by this city. So where they explain, they said that this la in the beginning of this ayat is za'ida, which means it is izafi, it's extra. And sometimes for eloquence and for the wazn and the weight of the ver verses, these things are used in Arabic as well as their examples of such thing in other languages. And because Quran is an eloquent book, it's at the peak of eloquence. This was something which was revealed onto the heart of our Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was a challenge to the people of Mecca at that time to bring forth something similar to this chapter or something similar to this book if you have any ability. And therefore, it was at the highest level of eloquence. So we see but certain some translations try to justify the word la by saying the prophet is actually, Allah is actually saying, I do not need to swear by the city. In what sense? In sense that when you know something is very, very obvious, you do not need to mention it. You say, well, you know, it's so clear that I do not really need to show it to you. It's so obvious that I really do not need to show it to you. So this is what Allah is saying, that it is so obvious that I do not really need to swear by the city. In fact, when I, am, when I am swearing and taking an oath by the city. So some have tried to justify the word, word la by mentioning the translation as such. The next ayah says, La uqsumu bihad al-balad wa anta hillun bihad al-balad. That when you are 
living in this city or when you are mawjood in this city. Again, it is referring to the wujud of our Prophet because he was living in Mecca at that time. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the only purpose that I am swearing by this city is not because there's Kaaba in this city. It's not because there's something else which is extraordinary about this city. The only fact that I'm swearing by this city is because of your wujud in this city. If it wasn't for your wujud in this city, I would not have sworn by this city. So that's one reason, that's one thing that has been mentioned as far as the translation goes. But others have translated the word hil, which comes from halal, that people at that time in Mecca considered it to be halal upon them to curse at the Prophet. And that is the reason Allah is saying, Anta hillun al balad. That it is considered to be halal upon the people who are living in Mecca at that time to curse upon you, and that's the way they treated Prophet. They harmed him with many ways, and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing it in this way. Third, I say, wa walidun wa ma walad. And I swear by a father and a son. Now there are different interpretations as to who this father is and who this son is. Majority of them have gone to the translation and the tafsir by mentioning that it is referring towards that father and the son who initially came to Mecca and they helped build the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of Kaaba and that is none other than Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Ismail alayhim salatu wasalam. So they were the ones who are being sworn, swear by Allah subhanahu or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken an oath by them as far as the father and the son goes. And the last ayah says that you know, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَ الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Indeed, we have created insan in hardship. If you look at, and this is where, inshallah, the topic and the discussion would be in the last ayat. The first three ayat I was just explaining because I've recited these ayat for you, so we don't want to skip through them. But the fourth ayat is where, inshallah, we'll be focusing tonight and leading it into the Masai of our fourth imam. So we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that indeed we have created mankind in what? In kabad. Kabad over here is referring towards pain and hardship. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word al-insan, it encompasses all of mankind. He does not need to use the word kullul insan or tamam al-insan. Those who know Arabic over here, sitting over here, the translation goes as this, laqad khalaqna al-insana. There's no word in this ayah which refers towards all. As is, if you were to translate this, you would say, you know, indeed, mankind is in pain or is in hardship. The word all is hidden over here. Similarly, when we recite Surah Asr, we would say, Wal Asr inna insana la fi khusr. We do not say that one person is in pain. No. It says, Inna al insana, bani no adam, every single human being is at loss. Except if they do this, this, and this, and those four things that are mentioned after the exception or the word illa. Similarly, over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ There's no exception. Every single person has hardships, has difficulties, distresses, and whatnot in their lives. Nobody is istisna and nobody is an exception from that law. You might look at some people and think that they're okay, they're, they're fine, there's nothing wrong with them, they're enjoying their life. And we look at the lives of, you know, the ce celebrities... We look at them and say, you know, that's the life that we need to have. That's the life people are really living, you know, the American dream and whatever you want to call it. But even them, they are going through distresses. It doesn't mean the more you have, the lesser problems you would be facing. No, in fact, the more you have, the more problems you have. The less you have, materialistically, the lesser problems you would be facing. Unfortunately, this is the criteria that we have developed and that's why we go after more and more considering and thinking the more we have, the lesser problems we will have existing. No, that is not the case. Every single human being on the face of the earth is facing problem. And I'll back this up with another ayat of Quran which is commonly recited usually on the nights when we are commemorating the wafat of some individual or the majalis of Soyam and Chihlum when we recite Surah Baqarah verse number 155 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts out by saying, وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوءِ وَالنَّقْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا صَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةً قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا لَهِ رَاجُونَ 
What does he say? He said, وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ Indeed and indeed. Again, those who know a little bit of Arabic or those who have studied the literature, they'll know. There are two taqeed. Two, twice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing on this verb. First this lam on nabluwanna and then the nun al thaqila at the end. Both are used in Arabic to emphasize. The translation would go as this. Indeed, verily. In Urdu we'll say beshak. Baghair kisi ikhtilaf ke, no doubt. Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. What is he saying? Nabluwannakum. We will... Give you or we will involve you. You will be mubtala. You will be facing or you'll be put to the trials and tests and tribulations from what? Min al khawfi, as far as the fear is concerned. Wal as far as the hunger is concerned. Wal naqsim min al amwale, as far as you know, lessening and the shortening of your amwal and wealth is concerned. Wal anfus, your lives are concerned. Wal thamarat, your businesses. And your crops are concerned. But those who are sabirin, O oh Prophet, give them glad tidings. Well, what should a sabirin? Give glad tidings to those sabirin who say and face all of these challenges, yet they come out with their heads high, facing these calamities, and then doing sabr in front of all of these calamities. Among them is an individual by the name of Imam Zainul Abidin, alayhi salatu wasalam. Because if you look at the life of our fourth Imam, it's packed with difficulties and problems. And it's sort of similar to the life of our Prophet as well. Imam is born with the pain that his birth causes the death of his mother, Bibi Sharbano. And then he loses his grandfather only after two years, Amirul Mu'mineen, in the 40th year of Hijrah. Imam is born in the 38th year. And he loses his grandfather in the 40th year. And then the Masaib continued. This is prior to Karbala. And then Karbala itself is, you know, Ummul Masaib. Masaib and the Musibat that is attached with Karbala. So we see that Musibat, as far as the calamities are concerned, every single person, individual, will face these calamities. The fact is how you come out of these calamities is where your hunar, your skill, and the jawhar that is hidden inside insan comes out. We look at the problem as to when hadith of Rasulullah says, Inna al-bala'a lil-zalimi adabun, wa lil-insani imtihanun, wa lil-anbiya'i darajatun. Bala, or again this calamity for zalimin is what? Is a lesson. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach him a lesson. So therefore zalimin, the unjust on the face of the earth, are tested. Because they want to be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tadib, wants to teach him a lesson. But mu'min is tested, why? For imtihan. We always hear this from the very beginning. This is an imtihan in your life. You're going through this imtihan and you will go through it, this exam, this test and this tribulation. Just like any other test that you have, you will go through this imtihan as well. So for mu'min, we consider this to be imtihan. We consider this to be test or tribulation. Then why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing the anbiya? What have they done? Usually we connect by saying the reason we are being tested is because we have done something. Because we have been wronged, we have wronged ourselves and we've done something wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through some tests. But then wouldn't it go against this hadith then that Prophet is saying that even anbiya are tested? And you'll say, well, you know, forget about the hadith. We, Quran is filled with the masaib of anbiya. From the very beginning, Hazrat Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, the musibat of Hazrat Nuh begins. Or from the very beginning, Hazrat Adam, his musibat begins. Then the musibat of Hazrat Nuh definitely is far bigger than that. And then all the way to the musibat of our own Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing the anbiya. Why does he need to test the anbiya? They are at the highest level. They are masoom. They're infallible. They haven't done anything wrong. So from here we understand that you're not tested because you have done something wrong. That is not the criteria inside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you have done something wrong, now you will be tested. If that was the case, then none of these imams or our prophets would be infallible because there were so many calamities in their lives and there were so many musibat in their life that will say, oh, you know, they must have done something. No. 
The reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing Anbiya, Darajatun. Because that's how they increase their ranks. And that's why we have different ranks of Anbiya among the prophets that we have. We have five of them who are considered to be Ulul Azum at the highest level. So one thing we need to get rid of from our minds is because the reason that I have so many musibat. I have this problem, I have that problem, I have family problem, I have kids problem, I have school problem, I have... Th because I've done something, I'm the most unfortunate person in the world. Those who have children, they have problems. Those who do not have children, they're tested with that. Those who have only girls, they're tested. Those who do not have... You know, there are different people and different problems everybody has. This is how you deal with these things. So nobody is exception from this law as far as he says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا insana fi kabad. So you and I understand that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing. And there's nobody exception from the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not even those who are at the highest rank, even the Anbiya. So you and I could not be any exception. But the fact that Anbiya are tested more than any other individual tells us that it is not something bad to be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He, first of all, does not burden you more than what you are capable of, you know, bearing the weight of. Secondly, it is not a bad thing to be tested over and over and over again by Allah. Because you are actually joining the saf and the lane of awliya Allah when he's testing you every so often. You are going in the same path when Allah is testing you and putting you into trial more often. Because if that was the case and we consider ourselves to be the most misfortunate and unfortunate human being in the face of the earth because we had all the troubles, sometimes that's the notion that people say, oh, look at that poor guy. You know, he lost his father. Then he lost his job, then he lost this, this, and you know, we're counting all of these materialistic things. That he's lost this, he's lost this, he's lost this, how unfortunate he is. If that was the criteria of being unfortunate, then our Prophet would be the most unfortunate human being on the face of the earth. Our Imam, fourth Imam, about whom we are discussing, would be the most unfortunate. Look at our Prophet, he's born and his father is already dead. Few years into his life, he loses his mother. That's a calamity. Being raised as an orphan is a calamity. And then he loses best of his helpers in the form of Hazrat Khadija alayha, and in the form of Hazrat Abu Talib. Calamities continue. Prophet is in charge to go ahead and propagate this religion, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is posing one challenge after another. So one thing we understand, with all of the challenges that Prophet had to face and all the calamities that he had to face, he came out to be the most beloved in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, if you and I are tested, that does not mean we're the unfortunate. We might be unfortunate in the sight of human beings, but we are the most lucky and most chosen one in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But then problem arises over here that yes, you and I... When human beings test someone, for example, after this majlis or first 10 days of Muharram, you came regularly and you attended the majalis. And then you were given a test, a written, written test, multiple choices. That what have you learned? The reason the honorable speakers would test you or after this majlis, if I was to give you, you know, a test, is because I want to know the level of your comprehension. What did you learn? I sat here for an hour and I spoke. What did I give and what did you learn? Or similarly, those who are in the profession of teaching, why do you uh, test your pupils? Why do you test your, test your students? The reason is because you're ignorant of their knowledge. So you want to learn what they have learned. You want to find out what is their level of understanding. Yes, you might have an idea but after spending a month or a semester with your students that what level each student belongs at, but still nonetheless you test them. Because as human beings, we do not know what level each individual is at. But then why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to test? Alimun bidhat al sudur. Quran says he's knowledgeable about what's hidden inside the chest of mankind. Alimun bidhat al sudur. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to test? This is where 
we need to understand the reason behind the test and the tribulations posed in front of human being. Laqad khalaqna insana fi kabad is what? The reason is, there are two reasons. One reason is that Allah SWT is testing us, pushing us to the limits so that you and I understand what are our hidden capabilities. What are salahiyat and the qualities and the capabilities of this mankind, this person is? Because until unless we're pushed to the limits, we will not be able to come out successfully. So I don't know if I can do a certain task until unless I'm forced to go ahead and do so. I will never try myself and put myself into that unless it was a coercion, I was forced into doing so. So first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us is, we understand what our worth is. We understand our value as human beings. We understand that what are our capabilities are. What are hidden capabilities and inner capabilities? Because we have never really tested ourselves thus far, so we don't know to what extent we're able to go. That's how you push yourself to see what extent you can go. Those who bench press and those who work out, they know. They push themselves and they work out and they say, you know, this is, I can maybe bench press this much or this much. So you slowly increase it as your capabilities increase. But for a person like me who's never bench pressed, I would never know how much I can or cannot. Or many of you over here who haven't done so, they would not know. They would not have any idea how much they can bench press, for example. So this is something until unless you force yourself to do so, you will not be understanding, you will not understand what are your hidden qualities are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this group of individuals when they're embarking on this journey towards Karbala because he knows that these people will, the, will be the ones who will be able to come out of all of this test successfully with their heads high. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. And the second reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests. One, we understand because he wants us to understand our own worth and value and our own hidden capabilities. The second reason he tests us because he wants us to understand that the time of difficulties, people in my surrounding, how much are they going to go ahead and stand by my side? So at first you understand yourself and your salahiyat, and the second level you understand those who are around you. Everything is going all right, mashallah, work is good, family life is good, you know, marriage life is good, everything is all right, you know, everybody's coming to you and enjoying and, you know, you have a life where there are no problems. Right away you start facing calamities, this is where friends start thinning out. As soon as these friends thin out, that's when you understand who really is, really is a friend. A friend in need is a friend indeed. And this, this really is something which is a phenomenon which comes out only when you're pushed to the limits. So that's the twofold reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests any individual. We're talking about or trying to relate the concept that when Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ fi kabad." Then we have indeed created mankind into distress, into difficulties. To be able to bring out the best of this mankind. And we see that the life of Sayyidul Shuhada and the life of our fourth Imam is a very difficult life. It's not an ordinary life by any means. But unfortunately, this is where we need to understand some of the misrepresentations that have come into our own circles, which, in other words, try to um, make this whole event of Karbala less important. What do I mean by that? Inshallah, in a couple of minutes, I'll try to get this point across, and inshallah, we'll conclude. What I mean by that is that a lot of the practices that have taken, you know, have become part of our commemoration, which we think that, you know, anything that is done in the name of Imam Hussain is allowed. Anything that is done in the name of Sayyidul Shuhada is okay. And anyone who questions that right away, those people are pointed out and penalized and sidelined. There are many practices that have infiltrated, come into our practices. 
At the end of the day, these, some of these practices are actually defaming, and some of these practices are actually, um, you know, getting rid of the importance of the event. Because people get focused so much on those things, they forget the actual tragedy. I think I might have mentioned this uh, before as well. And when we talked about it last year as well, the lessons learned from Ashura. One of the points that I kept on repeating, and that's why I think you might still have it in your minds, is that yes, we need to focus on how the whole event of Karbala took place. That is very important. We need to explain that to the whole world. You know, the way the children of Imam Hussein were killed, the way the ladies of this household were you know, paraded from city to city. We need to show them, we need to tell them, we need to make them understand. We already have seen this, we, oh, we have already heard this, and we have pictured, you know, imagined all of those scenes in our minds. It is very important to show that side of this event as to how the whole event took place. But far more important than how the whole event took place is why this event took place. Focus on that, work on that, so that you and I have a bigger job then. After these majalis, we go home and that's it. We're done. We'll start, start over again next year and we'll continue in the path again. No, there are certain responsibilities that lie on our shoulders. Imam Hussein and his companions, Imam Zainul Abidin, did not give this huge sacrifice for us to just commemorate them every year. Remember that every year and not bring any change not in ourselves, nor in the people in our surroundings. One of the motivations should be from this event is that we go ahead and, you know, learn what this religion is. This deen is what they sacrifice themselves for. This deen is the most important thing. What is this deen? It's a, it's a name of three A's, as I call it. Aqaid, Ahkam, and Akhlaq. Deen is translated into three things. Aqaid, ahkam, and akhlaq. Aqaid are the beliefs. They have to be strong. Ahkam are the duties that we perform on a daily basis. And akhlaq is on top of both of those things, which gives us the characteristics that we need to adopt. If you have this, that means you have deen. If you don't have this, that means you're lacking this deen. And a life without deen is a life of an animal animalistic life, because animal is also living and doing all of those things, but he lacks this deen. And that's what Imam Zainul Abideen sacrificed so many things for this religion. Look at, there's a hadith in fact from our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. illa thalatha. That people, irtad, comes from murtad, or, you know, turning away. Sixth Imam said, people turned away after Imam Hussein's shahadat, except three people. And then he names those three people. That's the musibat of our fourth Imam. Irtad danna all of them, except three people. Of course, family members were there. But we're talking about from the public. There were only three people who stayed with Imam. And these were the individuals by which Imam had some hope that he could do something. He does not have the member to him. In fact, for many years, he's unable to speak up. He's unable to give lectures. He's unable to, unable to propagate the way previous Imams propagated. But one thing Imam did do is that he paved the path for the next two Imams to come and do the job that he was unable. The gap that had been established in the time of our third Imam and in the time of our fourth Imam was filled in, and how it was filled in, in the time of our fifth Imam and our sixth Imam, when deen really flourished. So one of our duties is not to be stagnant and stop. No, among our duties is to spread this religion. You say, well, you know, there are certain religions for example, Jews, they don't want to include anyone else. They don't want to bring more, they don't want to convert more Jews. They don't want to make more Jews. That's not what our religion tells us. No. We're not making more Muslims because we want to increase our numbers and demographically we might be most in the society. No, that's not the reason. You're doing this tabligh so that you're bringing people out of darkness into the light. Look at it from that aspect. Not look at it from the aspect that we might be more in numbers. Demographically, we'll be more. 
You know, we will rule this world with the numbers of Muslims that we have. What good is it if you have billions of Muslims, yet only a bunch of people are ruling and running over you? It doesn't make any difference. So no matter how many you become, still you will be ruled by someone else. If that's the criteria, then, you know, billions, two billion, three billion would not make any difference. But what will make difference, we're going to go ahead and propagate so that we're able to bring people out of the darkness that exists towards the light that it is. So this notion should be cleared and cleared out of our minds that we do not need to include more people. We do not know. You keep on propagating because that's one of the things for why, why our imams sacrifice what they sacrifice for. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> And that's why we see the musibat, our fourth imam, really begins from the 38th year of, his, of hijrah, the year that he's born, when he loses his mother. In two years' time, he loses his grandfather, Amir al-Mu'mineen. In 10 years' time, he loses his uncle, our second imam. And then in Karbala, what happened in Karbala? You heard the Masaib. Yes, going through this shahadat was very difficult. And in fact, when Imam Hussein raised the istagatha, Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, when he said, Hal min nasir yansurna, hal min mughithin yughithuna, hal min dhabbin, is there anyone who will defend an haram rasulillah? Imam raised this istagatha. One of the reactions of this istagatha was what? My narrations mention that our fourth imam, in that, you know, condition that he was in, which is explained to be that he was in extreme fever, Imam al-Satawasalam is trying to come out of his tent with the sword in his hand. And there's a lady who's trying to pull this imam back. There's a lady who's trying to hold, get a hold of this bimar imam. Imam Hussein runs over to the tent and he stops our fourth imam. He said, oh my son, what are you doing? He said, Baba, you're calling, you're saying, Hal min nasir yansuruna, and you expect me not to reply? No matter what condition I might be in, I'm still going to reply to what you're saying. Imam understands the pain Imam Zainul Abideen might be facing, but he says, oh my son, this shahadat is something which is the, the easiest part of what we have come to do over here. We will give this shahadat and we will die and our musibat will end here tonight. But the musibat that lies ahead of you is something which no honorable man should ever see. What you will go through requires a bigger heart. What you will go through is definitely going to be a difficult task. Musibat upon musibat. Yes, this ayat is true. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي kabat. But there must be a limit to what musibat any individual can face. We look at some of the characters in this Karbala in the form of Janabi Zainab. What kind of heart Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this Zainab? Salamu That we see that she loses her children in front of her eyes. She loses her brother in front of her eyes. In fact, she loses brother like Abul Fadl al-Abbas in front of her eyes. And the musibah does not end over there. Yet Zainab makes it back to Medina. How, what kind of heart Zana possessed that she was able to perform what she did under these circumstances? Imagine when you and I lose a loved one. For example, if someone loses a brother or someone loses a father, how, how much musibat comes upon us that we forget even the most imminent things that are close to us. It'd be the last thing, imagine, from us to do and perform our wajibat, for example. Oh, this person just lost his father. If he didn't pray today, that's okay. Don't let him. Don't, don't worry about it. If he misses namaz, don't worry about it. He just lost his brother. Janab Zainab saw not just one, two brothers in the form of Imam Hussein and Hazrat Abbas. And there were 22, or something say 18 or 22 family members that are lost on that same day. Yet what Imam Hussein is saying to Zainab? La tansini fi salat al layl. Oh Zainab, do not forget me in your namaz al shabah in your Salat al-Layl. Imam has such confidence on Zainab that he says that even with all the calamity that has fallen upon her, she will still perform her Salat al-Layl. Allahu Akbar. That's the heart of Zainab. 
And when we come back to Imam Zainul Abidin, Imam Hussein stops him. He said, Oh my son, jihad is not wajib upon you because the earth cannot remain without the hujjat of Allah and you must remain. Imam shares the asrar and the rumuz and the secrets of imamat and then Imam makes his way back to maktal and this is where the jihad of Hazrat Imam Zainul Abidin begins. Imam wasalam, he travels into the same places, into Kufa, into Sham, and eventually when this caravan has come back, Imam wasalam, is back home. But every time food is brought for Imam, Imam died in the year 95 in the hands of Mal'oon who poisoned him, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, the ruler of the time. But Imam died that day when Janab Zainab had to come out without any veils in her head. Imam gave his soul the day when Umm Kulthum came out without any veil. Imam had basically died that day. But how Imam would have continued? It is only that when Minhal asks Imam this question, when he brings food to Imam, when he serves something to Imam, and Imam refuses to eat anything or drink anything, he says, Oh Mawla, you're Imam of time. How can we tell you to have sabr and patience? But how long are you going to cry and weep? It's been many years, it's been many weeks, it's been many months. How much are you going to cry and deprive yourself of the food and the basic necessities? Imam said to Minhal, you have not done justice to us. Yaqub had lost his son for a few years. He cried so much for him. The Quran says his eyes, his, his eyes were turned white and he went blind because of that. But I lost 18 of my family members and there was no one resembling them at that time and they were butchered and killed in front of me. Yet you're saying that I should do sabr. Allah وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلِبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ بارے اللہ ہماری سے بات قبول فرما ہم گناہ گار ہیں ہمارے گناہوں سے در گزر فرما ہمیں اہل بیت علیہ السلام کے نقش قدم پر چلنے کی توفیق عطا فرما ہمیں ان کی تعلیمات پر عمل کرنے کی توفیق عطا فرما ہمارے عوام کے ظہور میں تاجیل فرما ہمیں ان کے عوان و انصار میں شمار کر ربنا تقبل منا انکا انتا السمیل علیم ماتم حسین